Welcome to talk five in our series on Mark's Gospel. Today we'll be looking at Mark 1 verses 29 to 45 and we'll begin by reading verses 29 to 31. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. As we saw last time, Jesus has just cast a demon out of a man in the synagogue. He and his disciples now leave the synagogue and go to the home of Simon and Andrew. This passage gives us an interesting insight into family life at the time. Although Simon was married, his brother Andrew was living with them, and so was his wife's mother. For the extended family all to live under the same roof was normal at the time and is not uncommon in some parts of the world today. This may well account for the fact that later in his ministry, Simon Peter, also known as Cephas, was able to take his wife with him on his apostolic travels, as did some of the other apostles. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5. However, more important than the social conditions prevailing at that time is the miracle of healing so briefly described in these verses. Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. They tell Jesus. He responds immediately, goes to her, takes her hand and helps her up. She is healed straight away and is able to wait on them. So Jesus' response to the need is immediate and so is the healing. Interestingly, in Matthew's account of this miracle, Jesus simply touches her hand, Matthew 8, verse 15. And in Luke, we're told that he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, Luke 4, verse 39. Of course, the differences in these accounts are not contradictions. They complement each other and give us the full picture. They all show his willingness and power to heal. Sometimes Jesus healed with a touch, and others with a word of command. In this case, he does both. I've often preached about this miracle, usually from the passage in Matthew, and have commented that in many ways his word is synonymous with his touch. God touches us with his word. On one occasion in March 2009, on a visit to Portugal, where I was teaching for a week in Mount Hope Bible College near Lisbon, I was asked to do a weekend of teaching in a place called Tomar. On the Sunday morning, I was preaching about the power of Jesus and how the people, how he healed people just by touching them. I explained that today he often touches us through the message that is preached and that he could touch and heal people now, even while I was preaching. While I was saying this, I noticed a woman in the second row who was quietly crying. As soon as the service ended, this woman came to me and spoke to me. She did so through an interpreter, as I don't speak Portuguese. She insisted on showing me the lower part of her leg, which for some time had been very swollen, had caused her great pain, and which had been greatly discoloured. Her friend, who interpreted for her, confirmed that this was all true. However, during my preaching, the swelling had gone down completely. The discoloration had disappeared, and she was no longer in pain. Her tears were tears of joy. She pulled up her trouser leg and revealed a perfectly normal ankle. There was no evidence that she'd ever had a problem. God touched her through his word. Now verses 22, uh, 32 and 33. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. 
We saw last time that in verse 28, after Jesus had driven the demon out in the synagogue, the news spread quickly throughout Galilee. This is demonstrated by the immediate effect on the people of the town. In fact, the whole town gathered at the door. It's understandable that people who are suffering will flock to someone who is able to meet their need. But sadly, this doesn't always lead to genuine conversion, as the story of the ten lepers in Luke 17, 11 to 19 makes clear. And as we saw last time, the miracles Jesus performed in Capernaum did not bring the people to genuine repentance. In the New Testament, miracles almost invariably attracted the attention of the crowds, and the same is generally true today, though their effect seems to vary in different cultures. For example, in Africa, multitudes used to gather at the evangelistic and divine healing crusades conducted by Reinhard Bonker, but I know from personal experience and acquaintance with him that the effects of his ministry were considerably less in Europe. Rather, as in the ministry of Jesus, the Lord could do no mighty work because of their scepticism and even cynicism in that region, although he did lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them, we're told in Mark 6 verse 5. Despite this, Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. We're told in verse 41 and elsewhere that he did this because of his compassion. References are Matthew 14, 14, 20, 34, Mark 1, 41, 5, 19, 9, 22, and Luke 7, 13. So quite a lot of times the same thing is said. He heals because of his compassion. In healing the sick, he demonstrated the love of God even for those who were ungrateful. Just as later... He died for the sins of the whole world, even though he knew that many would reject him. In verse 34, Mark tells us that Jesus drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. We've already seen one example of this with the demon-possessed man in the synagogue in verses 24 and 25. Jesus tells the demon to be quiet because it knew who Jesus was, the Holy One of God. James 2.19 shows us that even the demons believe and shudder. They believe, but they do so grudgingly. Jesus silences all such testimony. He looks for a voluntary and glad acceptance of who he is, as the truth is revealed by the Spirit of God to those who repent and come to faith in him as their saviour. Finally, in Matthew's account of these miracles, chapter 8, verse 17, he says that Jesus performed his healings to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. This is one of the proof texts used by those who believe that Jesus died for our sicknesses in just the same way that he died for our sins. However, as I've argued in detail in my PhD thesis, and in more more simplified way in my book, Just a Taste of Heaven, whenever Matthew quotes the Old Testament, he does so in connection with the events in Jesus' life and ministry that he is there and then recording, not to something that will take place later. And in Matthew eight sixteen to 17 he uses the quote from Isaiah in connection with Jesus' healing ministry in Galilee, not in the context of his atoning work on the cross, which took place three years later. So, as we've already seen, Jesus' miracles are best understood as signs of the kingdom of God. They confirm the truth of the gospel message as they demonstrate God's power and his loving compassion for those who are sick. Verses 35 to 39 very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. 
Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you! Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Verse 35 undoubtedly reveals the key to Jesus' power. Although he was the Son of God, remember verse 1, and although he'd been baptised in the Spirit, verse 10, he still needed to spend time alone in communion with God. He got up very early, he found somewhere to be alone, and he prayed. It was surely on these occasions that he received revelation from God about everything he was to do. In John 5.19, after he has healed the man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day, he says, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. This surely makes it clear that even Jesus could not tell God what to do. And we as his disciples are to follow his example. We're God's servants. He dictates the the agenda, if we're to be used in healing as Jesus was, we must first hear what God is saying. The level of our authority is direct, directly related to the extent to which we are hearing what God has to say. But these verses also give us an insight into two other aspects of public ministry. Firstly, the external pressure of both the disciples and the general public demanding attention, verses 36 and 37. And secondly, the inward pressure of one's personal conviction of God's call and purpose in our lives, verses 38 to 39, and verse 45 is also relevant here too. God's call to serve him is what should motivate, motivate all we do. But if we're to be effective in his service, we must find the right balance between spending time with him and responding to the inevitable demands made by our fellow Christians and the desperate need of those who do not yet know Jesus. This is probably the most important reason why we need to follow closely the example of Jesus in seeking to win others for him. And finally, in verses 40 to 45, we have the account of the healing of the leper. Verses 40 to 42 first. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cured. There are several points of interest here. First is the fact that the leper came to Jesus. This was unusual in that lepers were required to keep their distance due to the highly contagious nature of the disease. Perhaps his boldness in doing so can be accounted for by the fact that he had presumably heard of the miracles Jesus had already performed and that, like the four lepers in 2 Kings 7, if you remember the story, he felt he had nothing to lose. Secondly, what he says makes it clear that he did not doubt Jesus' ability to heal him, but that he was unsure of Jesus' willingness to do so. I've often heard it said that to be healed, we must not only have faith that God can heal us, but that he will. But that's clearly not the case. Jesus healed the leper despite his lack of faith in his willingness to do so. But Jesus' words of reassurance, I am willing, are surely an encouragement to us all. This is the only case in the Bible where someone prays, in effect, Lord, heal me if it's your will. 
And Jesus replied, I am willing. In the light of this and the fact that Jesus never refused healing to anyone who came to him, we should surely continue to expect healing, at least until he shows us that there's a reason for his not doing so, as in the case of Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 11, where the apostle was told that God's grace would be sufficient for him. Thirdly, Jesus' motive for healing the leper was compassion. Ignoring social convention and the danger both of catching the disease and of being made ceremonially unclean, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man because he loved him. And we're reminded, as we saw in an earlier talk, of Jesus' willingness to be baptised, even though it made him look as though he was a sinner who needed to repent. These things all foreshadow, they're a prophetic picture of, all that Jesus was to do on the cross. Although he never sinned, he was willing for God to treat him as a sinner so that he could make us acceptable to God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, contemporary English version there. And he did so because he loves us. And fourthly, please notice that the healing was immediate. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured, verse 42. In the Gospels, Jesus' healings were almost always immediate. There's little evidence for miracles of gradual healing. Admittedly, in Mark 8, 22 to 26, the healing of the man, blind man, was not instantaneous, and the ten lepers who came to Jesus for healing were all healed, but it was only as they set off to see the priest, as Jesus commanded them, that on their way they were healed. Luke seventeen fourteen. However, it's clear from the context that these healings occurred almost immediately or at least very soon after Jesus had ministered to those who were suffering. This doesn't mean, of course, that God may not sometimes have a purpose in gradual healing today, but healings really need to be immediate if they're to fulfil their purpose as manifestations of the kingdom of God and as signs confirming the truth of the good news of the gospel. Now verses 43 to 45. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Why did Jesus tell him not to tell anyone about his healing? Because he didn't want people to come to him simply for the physical benefits they could get. He had compassion on the sick and never refused healing to anyone who asked for it. But he didn't go looking for the sick and the demon possessed. He didn't advertise his healings, nor did the apostles in the book of Acts. His miracles, if anything, advertised him. His priority, as we've seen, was to take time to hear what his heavenly father was saying. So he tells the man that he's healed to obey the law of Moses in Leviticus 14 for the priest to examine him and confirm the healing. We might have thought the man would have gladly obeyed Jesus' instructions out of sheer gratitude. But instead, he does the opposite. We're not told why, but whatever the reason, his enthusiasm to tell his story didn't help the cause of the kingdom of God. The proclamation of the good news of the kingdom of God is demonstrated with miraculous signs and wonders. But his kingship doesn't take away our freedom of choice or our responsibility to obey him. 
And surely the greatest evidence that Jesus is Lord is in the obedient lives of those who profess to follow him. If we want Christ's kingdom to be extended, we must do things his way. So finally, seven key points to summarise what we've been saying. One, Jesus' authority to heal sprang from the time he spent in communion with God and his obedience to what God revealed to him. Two, the purpose of Jesus' healings was to confirm the good news of the kingdom of God and to show his compassion for suffering humanity. Three, his healings as signs of the kingdom were immediate rather than gradual. Four, Jesus healed by a word of command or by a touch or by both. Five, while his healings brought multitudes under the sound of his teaching, relatively few became true disciples. Six, Despite this, his willingness to be identified with suffering and sinful humanity foreshadowed what was to happen at Calvary. And seven, his willingness and power to heal all who came to him, like his willingness and power to save all who come to him, were no guarantee that all would come. But he heals and he saves anyway, because he loves us. The choice is ours, whether we come to him or not. Next time, Mark chapter 2, the healing of the paralysed man. Till then, the Lord bless you.